things that are on the presentation they are so I just want to motivate log structures a little bit. So basically we wanted to generate smooth varieties into uh, similar varieties. There's going to be more of them. Um, and they need, to, you know, they're not no longer going to be smooth, but I, I degenerated the smooth variety into a bunch of pieces that are simpler that I can understand. Imagine taking a variety and breaking it over your knee, right? Into a bunch of pieces. So the log structure is going to sort of keep track of this degeneration for us. And the idea is we want to recover information about the smooth variety from log information about this. <clears throat> so let's start with an example. Let D be the union of the axes, uh, and U be the rest. Okay, so I'm going to define a sheaf on X, which uh, spits out the functions such that F restricted to U or U intersect to E is a unit. Okay, so it's not a global unit, but away from this union of divisors it is. So let's see what it does on these three open sets. Okay, well, yeah, the first thing to notice is that the units are always in here. If you're a unit everywhere, then certainly away from um, away from this divisor. And that these are just a sub sub sheaf of the regular functions. <clears throat> so M of B1 is going to have the units plus one extra function. So what function is uh, non-zero away from the x-axis? <laughs> okay, one. So I have y and I have powers of y. You've got to start with easier questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So what? Oh, yeah. So the function y and all the siblings are um, invertible away from the x axis. And for similar reasons, and the units and powers of x here. There, you know, x is not invertible, notably, but at least away from the x-axis that it's or away from the y-axis. Uh, yeah. And for M V3, I have both going on at once. Powers of x and powers of y. Okay. So since the units are always there, that you know it's kind of redundant. So Write m bar for m mod o star, okay, the rest of the sheet. And the point is that this remembers the boundary. Boundary or stratification. Okay, this is extra information than just A2. It's A2 plus this divisor, and it remembers this divisor. How does it remember it? Well, um, what are the stocks of M bar? Well, at the uh, x axis, I'm going to have a natural numbers, right? So now I'm, I'm drawing the sheaf M bar. Be a race in this. Um, the sheaf M bar is going to have stocks, um, the natural numbers on here, the natural numbers on here. Most of the time, it's just going to be zero because, you know, away from D, you're just saying that it better be a unit, full stop, right? And then here I have the natural numbers squared. So m bar is just the natural numbers to the power, and the power tells you how deep in the stratification you are, how many uh, you know components of your divisor are passing through that point. Questions on that? So yeah. m bar at x is just n to the depth of stratification. Okay, so I want to consider the set of strata. How many are there? There's four, right? So we have almost everybody. There's no n bar, right? So this is um, so this is on GM squared. There's you know n bar is zero. 
I'll just I have zero here. On the x-axis, I have the natural numbers. On the y-axis, the natural numbers, and at the origin, in square. All right, this is the set of strata with the um, with n bar on it. And there's relationships between the strata, right? This is kind of the generic point, so it specializes to the x and y axis. And likewise, the origin is in the closure of the x and y axis. Okay. So what is this? This is a finite topological space. So this gadget, getting a little busy here. I'm going to call theta of x. That's the set of strata. It's a finite topological space. And it has the sheaf. Okay, so this is called the Hartman fan or the chart or the tropicalization of uh, X. Okay, depending on the author. Um, uh, but anyway, so it's a finite topological space and it has the sheaf M bar on it. So M bar is really pulled back. From theta of x. So even though there's lots of points in A2, they all belong to four classes, and this remembers all the logarithmic information. Um, okay, so another way of describing theta of x in this example is that it's the orbits, right? A2 is a toric variety if you if you're very sophisticated, but uh, basically these four points are just the orbits of A2 under the GM action, right? Um, so this is A2 mod GM, uh, GM squared. Okay, and that's important that the set of strata looks like a toric variety mod its source. So in particular, we can depict this data, this finite topological space that we're going to be carrying around all the time um, by the toric variety. So what's the fan of A2? It's just, you know, r greater than or equal to zero squared, or maybe 10. Okay, and from this, I, I, I can write down the <laughs> finite topological space by just taking the set of cones and equipping them with the, the corresponding cone, basically. There's a dual cone. Is this example clear? Um, so what is a log scheme? Basically, it's this. So a log scheme is just a scheme with a map to a finite topological space, which is of the form, uh, I don't know, say x, b mod t, where b is a toric variety. Okay, that's the definition of a log scheme. If you know better, uh, keep it to yourself. <laughs> so, and so we're going to remember this data by just drawing the fan of D. So, um, you know, the, the data of this finite topological space is as good as the data of the fan. There's a reason it's called a fan. Okay. And we can even relax this a little bit and say theta of X could really be a union of uh, being on T's. Okay, so that's Sorry. Yeah. So how to recover the other definition from this one? I mean, use I'm the monoid. I'm. Yeah, you pull back the log structure on theta x. What is log structure on theta x? So this has a canonical log structure because each point, you know, it's a finite topological space, and each point is equipped with the monoid corresponding to that cone, or the dual of that cone. So what okay. is log structure on the stack? Uh, yeah, but this is a finite topological so space. The map should be continuous, or not to be seen. Um, I mean, that, that you said anti continuous, but let's ignore that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have to be anti continuous. Okay, so, uh, uh, for, for those who do like stacks, I will say it makes more sense, right? These are two different objects in two different categories. So it makes more sense if you consider this as a stack. And now these are both stacks, so you can make sense of maps to them. But that's. I mean, just think of that example, basically. There's no need for such a consideration. So what are morphisms? 
Well, log schemes are just schemes plus this. So morphisms are going to be morphisms of schemes with a compatible morphism of the finite topological spaces. Okay. And you know, I'm gonna write X of being the pair of X and its Okay, so I say that X is log smooth or log flat, log purple, log whatever, if the map from X to theta of X is smooth, flat, or whatever. Okay. Um, uh, what? Yeah. X, you log smooth or what? Log smooth, log flat, or log. No, over what? Uh, well, that's, <clears throat> this is absolutely. And then the relative version, there's also a relative version of it that uh, Hare is asking about. So if you have a morphism of log schemes, yeah. you also say that this is log smooth, smooth or log, whatever, if the map. So this is a commutative square. Yeah. So I get a map to the pullback. And I want that map. Uh, this map <coughs> is smooth. Okay, so by absolute case, you mean over a point? Over a point with trivial log structure. I see. Yes. Okay, so. Oh, I also, I don't quite have enough room, but uh, this was used. Like log things are basically defined this way. They're defined as the relative things of the scheme over the argon thing. So for example, the log cotangent complex uh, of x, I don't know, let's say x over y is just the ordinary cotangent complex of x over, sorry, over this object. So basically think of if you want to do a log thing, you just do the ordinary thing for this one. Do I write? No, I push this down. <clears throat> so I want to do some more examples. Log curves. So if you take some um, nodal curve, um, you can consider its dual graph. Okay, so just a point for each component and a, an edge for each node. And surprisingly, this is the art and fan of the curve. Okay, it doesn't exactly make sense because this isn't a cone, but this is sort of slang for the cone over this object. Okay. So you'll notice I really do need to allow unions of these sort of things. I'm already sort of gluing a loop, right? That's not exactly a cone, it's sort of a cone taped together. Um, so people will just draw the dual graph, but it's sort of slang for the cone over the dual graph. And this is the art and fan of the truck of the log curve. something two dimensional. So it's it's yeah, which is a bit uh, well, well, think of this as the, the degeneration. Remember in the ah, yeah, I see. So you, you look at it as a, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is not absolutely log flat anyway, so I don't have that information. I mean, you could draw the cone uh, of uh, the log point below, and then it's sort of relatively one dimension. Yeah. So you you may or may not consider this as over the a point with some log structure. And if it's rank one, then it looks like this, but it could be other ranks too. Yeah. Um, so, or more generally, people consider uh, simple normal crossing divisors. Okay, what is that? It's, let's say you have a smooth ambient scheme X and you just have sort of locally uh, my A2 example, right? Or AN, if you, you know, use your imagination. Um, so, you know, locally, this just looks like the union of the coordinate axes, but globally, this divisor has a bunch of components. And so what you do is one way to define it is it's the cone over the dual complex. Uh, okay, so I drew a pretty boring 
um, SNC divisor, but anyway, I take the dual complex and then I just do the cone over it, right? That's one way to obtain a tartan fan. But another way is to um, look locally. So I get in, th this looks like A2. The fan of A2 is uh, this guy, this first quadrant. Over here, I get another A2. I'll just write in hydrogen. So okay, I'm going to draw back this. And here, I get a third A2. And then I glue them together along, right? This ray corresponds to this divisor. Each ray corresponds to a divisor. And this divisor is uh, corresponds to this guy and this guy. So I should really glue together those divisors and wind up with uh, this thing, which is contracted this thing. Okay. So SNC divisors, it's sort of easy to describe here. Let's do an example. I think we've got to move in a synoptical light on the picture of cones. What? What do you mean, synoptical light on the picture of cones? Oh, the vertical line, I drew this first. Uh, so some people think of the dual complex, you just have a dot for every component, right? So component, 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 component. <laughs> and then you draw edges between them if they intersect. And then I just take the cone over. It was kind of like what we did for the curves. That's the point. So, yeah, let's do another example. Um, so I want to. I have a two, and I have the cone of a two. Right, this morphism, this finite topological space. So what happens if I change the cone over here? This is what uh, Sam was talking about yesterday. <laughs> So I'm going to do the simplest thing I can, just add a subdivision. So I used to just have one cone. Well, one two-dimensional cone. Now I have two two-dimensional cones. And uh, what does this mean? Well, the rays are divisors. These two rays are the x and the y axis. And so I'm adding one new divisor, and it maps to the origin. So surprise, surprise, it's the blow up of A2 at the origin. Okay, and this is really a pullback um, in some sense. So I get blow ups at strata, so not all blow ups, but the blow ups at strata by just subdividing my fan. Okay, and this is the best example ever um, because so this is called a log blow up or log modification where you just subdivide the fan. You know, and the old fan and the new fan are both toric varieties and they correspond to finite topological spaces and you just pull that. Okay. So these things are remarkable. They're surjective. Okay. So what? Uh, they're proper because they're blow ups, um, but also they're monomorphisms. Okay. This is what's really surprising. Um, because I'm contracting a whole P1 down to a point. I'm losing a lot of information. And yet this is sort of categorically an injection. And the reason why is because remember, our log schemes are not just schemes, they're schemes plus this guy. And I can just do the intersection over here. So take this uh, fan inside of here, intersect with itself. What should the fiber product, right? Each time I'm just intersecting a cone with itself, I'm just going to get that cone back. So here it's pretty clear the intersection should just be the same thing again. In other words, that this map is a monomorphism, right? That's the you know potato potato. Uh, but um, so this is a monomorphism, and since this is pulled back to Martin fans, it means that this uh, this blow up this log blow up is a monomorphism, even if I restrict to the origin. And I just have the P1 mapping to the origin, that's still a monomorphism. It's crucial here that I, I pick the right origin. So here I mean just the origin as it naturally lands in A2 with its N2 log structure. If I chose a different log structure, I could uh, get a different answer. But it's a monomorphism in the category of log scheme. Yeah. Sorry, please. 
and restriction on subdivision? Are you taking exactly out of the way? That way, can you put it? Uh, yeah, you can. You can do basically any of it. Those would give different subdivisions. They would look a little bit different, but and, and you can keep subdividing, right? But I think the, the, I mean the question is if you buy some big subdivision, you see it already. Otherwise, you have to subdivide and then take a sequence of blocks to get that. So it's, yeah, I mean here I meant the very centering one one, but but it, the others are possible. Yes, but the others you're not having a divisor, right? Um, no, you're still you're definitely a divisor on this space, and then this map is flat, so it should be. You do sub subdivisions and you make it, and then you, of course, you, you can get there to uh, the sequence of isentric subdivision. Of course, once you're doing uh, this, uh, this, this blow ups, but then you have to contract uh, the ones that show up, uh, some of the things which convert one to the end that you don't want to work. So it's a sequence of blow ups and blow ups. Sure. Um, but it's also just a blow up. It's a way to blow up. It's a way to blow up. Yeah, it's a way to blow up. Yeah. yeah. It's good that you can go up and down, but you don't have to. You don't have to. Yeah. I, I mean, actually, you can refine the whole thing. You can refine any subdivision by the very centric subdivision. Okay, that's not true. But if you are just fiddle with the very centric subdivision a little bit, you can refine any by uh, example like that. But none of that really is relevant. Um, so there's one more property I want to mention. This is log a call. Okay, why is that? Well, we said that log blank. So I have this morphism from X to Y. And we said log blank is first you take the fiber product of the arc chains, and then you look at the resulting map. The resulting map is the identity, notably a tall. So this map is log a tall. And what's weird about this is that in ordinary schemes, a proper monomorphism would be a closed immersion. And in ordinary schemes, an a tall monomorphism would be open. So these are somehow both closed and open and surjective. They're as close to isomorphisms as you know categorically that you could want. Okay. This also gives us our first endpoint that log intersections, I think this is what Rahul said, are uh, different from ordinary intersections. Or log pullbacks are different from ordinary pullbacks, right? We took the self pullback of this example over the base and we got itself, which is crazy because, you know, especially in this example, if you take the fiber product of this guy with itself over here, in ordinary schemes, you get P1 cross P1. Here, you just get P1. Okay, so log intersection, the log fiber products and intersections are different from uh, regular ones. Okay, any questions? So is this your... Uh... What? So you said P1 product with P1 is P1. So do you mean the fiber product in the category of FS log scheme? Yes, FS log schemes. So for those of you who have heard the words, I'm working in FS log schemes. Can I explain? Actually, fine here too, but whatever. What? Can I explain you my long? What is log? No, why is it log block? Why is it log at all? Yeah, okay. So we got to be really uh, by the definition here. So what does log at all mean? Uh, this is x, this is y, this is theta of x and theta of y. And the definition of log at all is I first pull back. And then I look at the map uh, from X to the pullback. But the pullback is just X. And the identity map is a tall. I guess you could call it log identity um, if you want to. Okay. Uh, so that's 1.1. Let's talk about intersection theory. Uh, 
Um, the first thing to say is Bezu. Okay, so if you have two <coughs> of degrees uh, D and E in D2, uh, C and D and uh, D2, then uh, they move. Z points. Okay, pretty classical. And to make it true, of course, you have to count with multiplicity. So, for example, the parabola meeting uh, the x axis, this should be counted as two. And uh, you need to define the multiplicity of the point. You can't just take the literal number of intersection points. So this is surprising, um, but I want to talk about how you define this multiplicity. Okay, so the multiplicity is really local around any intersection point. So if I have two divisors, I look at I look at their intersection, I look at their intersection points, and I just kind of zoom in to calculate the multiplicity. I don't need to know the global nature of my variety. But what is the like structure on CMD? I'm not doing any log structure yet. So this, this is just classical, classical intersection. Um, yeah, so let's do an example. Let's take the nodal cubic. Okay, X is just my point in there, and Z is the cubic. And let's imagine I was intersecting with a line. Okay, but I don't really care about the line. All it's saying is that to calculate the intersection of this line with Z, I just have to zoom in very close around the intersection. And very close around the intersection point looks like a pair of lines. Okay. This pair of lines is called the, um, the normal cone. And so what this is saying is that intersecting with, with X inside of Z is the same thing as working on this simpler space um, that is approximately Z in a neighborhood of X. Okay, so um, it'll be easier to work with this. And so it's preferable. This is how you get the right intersection multiplicities. So Z and the normal cone are homotopic. They, there's a flat family from one to the other, from one to the other. And um, they're the same dimension. And they're basically the same, uh, they have the same intersection. So I first replace Z uh, by this cone. So let's define the intersection product. Uh, the intersection product, uh, also known as, let's see, the Gizan map. For the virtual fundamental class, as basically the class of the C X over Z. Okay. And uh, I need to be intersecting with something. So, so this sometimes is called uh, the virtual fundamental class of X. Um, I take its class, I can take its class in Chow. Or in K theory, or uh, you know, you're warmly invited to take this elsewhere. Um, but uh, this isn't exactly an intersection, right? It feels like I should be intersecting two things. So if you have, um, so F is the map from X to Z, and I have another Y inside of Z, and I want to intersect X with Y, then the intersection of X and Y and Z. Is also denoted by this, and it's basically the class of the pullback. Not sure. Basically, the class of the pullback. Okay, it's a little. It's it's approximately that. It's the class of the other normal kind of sets. Um, for y inside of z. Okay. 
So this is how you get the intersection multiplicity. It's through replacing the ambient space by a simpler local approximation. The basic properties that we're going to need uh, are how, so this is a very important class. Um, it's, you know, the intersection multiplicities, all our intersection theory is going to be done through this class. Um, and we need to know how to push it forward and pull it back. So those are the two basic things we could hope for. But the virtual cycle is an intersection of this cone with some zero section. That's just the image of this under an isomorphism. So it's still this class, but it happens to be that chow of the uh, uh, virtual class. No, perfect abstraction theory is the same as the base. So it's still this class un under an isomorphism that I'm ignoring. Uh, maybe I can explain it better. Also. Um, okay, so I want to know how the virtual class of this guy and the virtual class of this guy relate. I want to know when they pull back and when they push forward. So pull back says that um, if I pull back twice, it's the same thing as pulling back once. Okay, this is how um this is how i know to uh this is how i can compare the intersection theory of x over y with the intersection theory of x prime over y prime, or rather x prime over y but. and uh there's also a push forward formula that the push forward of the virtual class of x prime over y prime is the uh of the okay, and a weaker form of this is known as Costello's formula. So if Q is proper birational, it just says that the push forward of the virtual class of X prime is the virtual class of X. So now uh, let me introduce the product formula. So the main place that these guys are used is in Grom of Witten theory. So X is mainly going to be the moduli space of curves mapping to some target. Okay, this is just maps from curves into V, stable maps. And the goal is to use this, uh, use this virtual fundamental class to count curves in here with certain properties. Okay, properties like passing through points or uh, tangency conditions in one setting. So the product formula says, so this is due to Kinsevich and Barron. It says that if you have two targets and you want to count the number of curves uh, in the product, It's the same as the number of a curve in B, a curve in W, and they're the same curve. Right? Of course, that's what a product is. I'm, of course, throwing everything possible under the rug. Uh, the way to say this in virtual fundamental classes is that the virtual fundamental class of the product. Uh, Is uh, is a Gizan pullback of the two virtual fundamental classes. Okay, where this diagonal, what's it doing? It's just making sure that the curves are the same. Okay, so this is great. This is twenty years old. Um, and Savich and Mon, uh, no, and Savich and Baron and Mon, maybe. Um, uh, but so we're talking about log geometry. How do we combine these? Uh, we want to study log stable maps. So the definition is basically the same. It's curves mapping to a target, but both of these are log schemes. Now. So logarithmic maps. 
and the stability condition is the same. Why do I want to do this? Well, remember at the beginning of the talk, our goal was to degenerate smooth varieties into uh, into uh, singular varieties that are simpler. So we can degenerate any smooth variety into pieces that look like this, and these are a lot simpler. And then the goal is always compute the log stuff of this to regain information about the regular stuff of this. Um, and the reason you need log maps is to remember how these two glue together. Okay, I need to remember a little more information about uh, the boundary, how the curves map into the divisor at which they need to. Okay, so section two, log intersection theory. Uh, sorry, I struggle with the. So, um, yeah, let's talk about log intersection theory. Right, we want to combine parts uh, 1.1 and 1.2. So the first problem you notice is that the log intersection is not the same thing as the ordinary intersection. Right, uh, we did that example of the fiber product. Um, of the, of the blow up, but let's do another example. Uh, and this example will show that log Bezu fails. How do we do that? We haven't defined any intersection multiplicities yet, but it's doomed. Okay. So <laughs> consider A2, uh, and I'm going to take two curves in there. D for the diagonal and C just for the x-axis. Okay, so I have C and D and A2. In particular, they're just lines. Uh, so, whoops, A1 with the usual log structure. Okay, and I'm doing A2. I should do D2, but uh, you know it's the same. Okay, so and x is A2. So I want to compute. Um, ideally, I'd like to define. You know, a log uh, multiplicity. I mean, I did, but uh, but this is our goal. And yet, uh, so first we need to just define or figure out what is the uh, log intersection, and then we'll endow with multiplicity. Right? We need to find the intersection points. So I hope you agree. These are both uh, degree one, and so they should meet in one point. So let's see if they meet in one point. So on charts, theta of d, d is just a1. How many divisors are there on a1? With the usual Tory log structure. There's just the point, right? There's, there's the origin. So there should be one ray, and that's it. This is a very simple origin. So the map from d to a2, we know the fan uh, of a2 is you know, our favorite first quadrant. And we can check that the map lands right in the diagonal. In particular, if I were to subdivide, I would factor through here. Right? D factors through this blow up that we did earlier. And since this is a monomorphism, I can take the intersection here just as well as I can on here. There's no difference. So let's compute the intersection of C and D on here. And uh, Joyously fail. Okay, 
So this, <coughs> what is going on in the schematic picture of this diagram? So I have A2. Uh, so I have A2. We know that this subdivision corresponds to blowing up A2. I had my curve B mapping in as the diagonal, and we see that it lifts. It's going to um, it's going to map as the strict transform in here. Okay. So kind of let's call this tilde. It's just that. And if I take the strict transform of C, I'm going to so the strict transform of the x-axis just narrowly misses the diagonal here. In other words, they don't meet, right? They're coming at the origin from different angles. So the log fiber product is the empty set. I don't care how you endow this with multiplicity, you're just going to get zero. We expected these guys to meet, they don't. All right. And also we have an example that I'm not going to get to, that the log product formula, in ordinary chow is wrong. Okay, what do I mean by the log product formula? I mean, um, same thing I wrote earlier, but log virtual fundamental classes, uh, sorry, ordinary, <laughs> okay, you're not supposed to know what that is yet. Ordinary virtual fundamental classes. Uh, oops. Okay, I can just take these log moduli spaces, write down the same thing, and it's very false. It, it actually winds up being kind of similar to this. this uh, yeah. Okay, so what are, yeah. So it seems to me that you're saying that if I have a monomorphism, then uh, when computing fabric product, I can change one, one space with the other. That's right, the ambient variety in which you're taking a fiber product not the two summits. So think about it like if I'm intersecting two things in a very large space and they both fit inside a much smaller space, it doesn't make a difference. But use the magic square of the <coughs> field. Of, you know. So is it because you forgot to include the contribution coming from uh, the section in the call? Um, well, contribute as much as it like. It, it's going to be in the child groups of the empty set. So. This is not a. But if you do the intersection and the chow of that call, you do get one. Um, these two do not intersect in this. No, no, no. In the chowing of that fact, that's that's fine. You get the uh, if you write it's chowing, you get uh, you have to have an another class. The intersection of the two arrays is one. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I I don't understand that, but. Uh, it's certainly true that these two don't intersect. And I think, I mean, the problem is that I gave them both A1 load structure. So you have a different load structure, and then you would get the strict transform instead of the or total instead of strict. Yeah, maybe, maybe you would think about that. So, uh, definition we have this problem. We have log intersections. Um, you know, our, our expected formulas like log A2 and the log product formula fail. Um, how can we say this? So, to find the log intersection product or normal cone, the same way you define everything, right? It's the ordinary normal cone of X over this full. Just like the log cotangent complex. Okay, this is in my thesis, um, and this goes by many names. It's also, you know, the log virtual fundamental class of X or uh, log Eson pullback, uh, maybe of, of Y. Okay. Um, so basically what you're doing is subdividing theta of Y at the image of X, right? I, I'm, I'm pulling back along the, the map of these finite topological spaces. So I'm kind of subdividing Y into theta of x first. I'm doing these kind of necessary blowups first. I'm looking at the image on fans, subdividing at the image, and then doing intersection. Okay. 
So in that example earlier, we had theta to B, or theta to the argentan of B, the argentan of A2. And the first thing we should do, I mean, this is to calculate the log fiber product as well as the log intersection multiplicity. The first thing we do is subdivide at the image. Okay. And we get uh, we get a factorization of the map from D to A2 through the pullback along this subdivision. <coughs> I guess I'll call it this. Okay. So the first thing we do is replace A2 by B, just like we replace the ambient variety, or we replace our varieties by uh, normal cones in the intersection product. Replace A2 by B and then do the regular intersection stuff here. So this process of taking the image of a map of cone complexes or Artin fans. Uh, this is called transversalization. This process is due to a whole bunch of people. Uh, it's the same transversalization that Sam and um, and Francesco were talking about. Um, and in in uh, future work, we have a universal transversalization. But that's so it's something we will. So basically, that's the idea. First transversalize, then do the regular intersection stuff on B. What, what do you mean you have universal transversalization? Like a minimal one, like all other transverse maps mapping to it will factor through that. <clears throat> Sorry, but, but for, for what? Like you fix a morphism and then- Yeah, anything. Yeah. But I mean, it's not semi-stable reduction. Yes, it's semi-stable reduction. So, I mean, this is due to a whole bunch of people. It's due to, it's due to Ogus, Nolcho, yeah. a lot of people in this room. Okay. Um, and so one thing this is saying is that you need to consider uh, divisors and intersection you know, varieties on blow-ups of A2. I'm replacing A2 by some blow-up and I'm looking at ordinary uh, divisors and stuff on that. So, so is D to B strict? Uh, now it is, yeah. So this is strict, which for the uninitiated just means same log structure, right? And this is a log blow. -up. It's the same log blow up we did an example of in the And what this is saying is that for Chow groups, for cohomology theories of log schemes, you want to consider cycles on blow ups. Okay. Log Chow of A2. You want to consider these, these things living on blow ups like these. Okay, and the same definition is made for log A2. So you look at all the blow ups of A2 and you look at the K theory groups of all of those. Now, whether you want to take a co limit or a limit over, over all these blow ups is, you know, both are perfectly valid and far be it for me to tell you what to do. Um, I got a assumption from F. Um, F being a map from X to Y. Yeah. So probably finite type. Uh, you need an obstruction theory that I'm not going to talk about um, to make sense of that. I would like to, uh, if you had the second theory you asked for the, the uh, I don't know, at least LCI, because you wanted that to bundle. No, you don't want it to be LCI. You don't, it doesn't have to be LCI in the usual intersection. Let's, let's talk about that afterwards, but that's that's exactly what I said with the perfect obstruction. Um, yeah, so. It says there's no log flatness assumption on your cycle. Uh, well, this is log flat. Uh, but no, not a okay. um, Yeah, and this is due to uh, everybody in this room. Uh, so Shokarov first, uh, Barrett, um, Holmes, Bixton, Schmidt, and Kato, Ito, Nakayama, Usui did the log cake. And yeah, there's some precedent in work of Kato. Okay, so we define log Chow groups. It's going to be the co limit or limit over the Chow groups of blow ups of your base variety, whatever X is. Okay, of log blow ups, sorry. Okay, so a bunch of questions arise. Uh, Um, 
does uh, is the log virtual fundamental class uh, well defined in log chow, right? We took a whole limit of a bunch of blobs and uh, we want to know that our log intersections are compatible with our log chow. Uh, you know, in log chow, that's one question. Uh, does log bay zoo hold? Um, uh, what about the log product formula? Log Costello. You know, everything that I talked about. So what do I mean by this? I have a log virtual fundamental class. And if I replace these virtual fundamental classes by log virtual fundamental classes, and these intersection, these Gizon maps with log Gizon maps, uh, can we agree uh, at once? Okay. Any questions? So I have a stupid question. So the log fundamental uh, class, uh, virtual fundamental class, element in child or what? So this is going to be. Uh, so remember that the log virtual fundamental class is C log x over y, and we consider it in chow what? of x. Log Y? Sorry. Yes. So, yes. so log chow. Well, that's the question. Does it live in log chow? Okay. So, based on time, maybe I should just tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, if if y if y is log smooth, then yes, this lives in log chow, and it also lives in log k theory. So. Uh, Yes, if y is log smooth, there's examples where it fails if you're not log smooth. Um, uh, this doesn't push forward to the virtual class if you if you do blobs, right? You want, yeah, it, it just doesn't live in this limit. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so this holds in, in both uh, log chow and in log k theory. The chow is HBMW and the log k theory is the quantum k theory product. So, um, okay. But for you, why would we like the arts and crafts? Right? So this is totally fine. This is, yeah, why this could be the art and pen or log of y or something. Yeah. Something like that. Is log flat enough? Is log flat enough? Um, not by the proof that we use, but but you should say this is valid for the log stable maps. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. For log stable maps, you only ever care about y log, log smooth because you're talking the target y in your favorite examples is just the space of curves, space of number curves. So so this is all we care about. Um, log base zero, I think, would be a very interesting master's thesis. The answer is like certainly yes, but uh, someone should. So what um, is the state of log base? Uh, well, you have to make sense of the degrees, but certainly it holds on all the blowups. Um, so the degree should probably be the self intersection or something like that. So the expected quantity of the push forward of the self intersection of curves is governed by the degrees which you define by self intersection on all the blowups. I think that's. I think that's going to be a topology. Yeah, it's basically a topology. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, okay, so the most basic thing we need to ask about these classes is how do we push them forward and how do we pull back? So we want to show that uh, yeah. if I um, pull back and then push forward, it's the same as if I push forward and then pull back. This is false in log chow groups. However, uh, the weaker form log Costello does hold. So if Q is proper birational, then uh, the push forward of the log virtual fundamental class is the log virtual fundamental class. Okay, so that's how you push forward classes. Um, 
Uh, and in, I want to remark that in K-theory, this uses a version of Hiranaka's push forward theorem. So this is much harder in K-theory than in ordinary chat groups. What's Hiranaka's push forward theorem? That um, between two smooth things, a proper birational map, if you take the derived push forward of the structure sheet, you get the structure sheet. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, based on time, I think I'll just write down the log product formula. So the main result is that we proved the log product formula in chat groups and in H3. So remember that M log of V is just the maps from curves to V that are log maps. So both, so V, your target is endowed with a log structure to even consider this, and your uh, curves also have log structure. This is similar to Lee's space, if you know about the uh, expansions. So theorem, due to my thesis and also Drew Varangonathan, if V and W are log smooth, um, so for example, torque varieties or SNC divisor pairs, then the count of curves in V cross W is the same as the count of a curve in V a curve in W and they're the same curve. And to make sense of this, I mean the virtual fundamental class of log stable maps to the product is the log intersection of the two virtual fundamental classes. Okay, and this fails if you don't take the log intersection. Um, and we also proved it in uh, log K theory with the uh, two hit angle. Um, all right, and I, I want to state that this is very useful. So, in ordinary Gromov Witten theory, this is sort of a proof of concept. It's just oh, what a relief. Um, here, it's extremely useful, thanks to uh, Ajith Kumaran, uh, who we're lucky to have in the audience. Um, so the reason is almost everything is a product in log geometry. In regular geometry, you, you just have to be lucky to have something that is literally a product. In log geometry, this applies to every toric variety. So let's see that happen. So first the theorem of a Gramovich and Wise that um, if you take a blow up of your target, The map on uh, log stable uh, maps is also a log blow. Okay. In particular, these two have the same log intersection. All the uh, Grand Whitman variants, all the curve counts of V are the same thing as the curve counts of V tilde. This is amazing because it's so false in ordinary Grand Whitman theory. If you blow stuff up, it's going to totally change the ordinary Gromov Whitman variance. There's even conjectures about the Krepin resolution conjecture, or Krepin conjecture is uh, very specific cases of that, saying what happens to the Gromov Whitman variance. Here, they're just the same. They're spoiled. Uh, okay, so how does this relate to that? So consider the log Gromov Whitman variance of any toric variety whatsoever. That means I have a random thing. Right? This is my torque variety, it's fan as that. Could be anything. Now, take P1 cross P1, or uh, P1 to the end, you know, if you have a higher dimensional torque variety. Trivially, there is a subdivision of both. Okay. And what that's saying is that the log row of invariance of this are the same as those of this and of this. Is really so trivial in general? Yeah. But what, what I'm, I'm slightly concerned in high dimension. Okay. Um, yeah, you definitely already have this. There are some subtleties, but okay. uh, but as far as what I said, this is definitely always true. Um, okay, so there's a mutual refinement of these two fans, which means these two have the same log norm theory. Which means there's only one log Gromov Whitman variant, right? 
once you know p1 cross p1 or however whatever dimension you like you know everything of that dimension and uh an algorithm of drew then uh, uh computes the log norm with invariance of these and so for every single one uh for the log norm with invariance of every single photograph that's a good place to say 